Let's pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and for the gospel that we can gather together this morning to learn more of you and your way of salvation. Lord God, we ask that you would lead us into your truth which sets us free. Pray that you would guide us by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Right, well, we are <coughs> making good progress with our study of the confession, and we have come to our 28th session this morning, which uh, deals with chapter 20. The heading of the chapter is the gospel and its gracious extent. And you'll see there there's a sort of a subheading, which is entitled the special revelation of the gospel. Now, <coughs> just... Uh, once again, as we normally do, let's consider a few questions. Firstly, why is it important to understand the gospel in God's economy? Secondly, what is the difference between general revelation and special revelation? To which category does the message of the gospel belong? Thirdly, when was the gospel first announced and what is its essential content? Fourthly, can a person be saved without hearing the gospel? Fifthly, why has the gospel been preached in some places but not others? And question six, do we need any other knowledge apart from the gospel in order to be saved? Now, there are some interesting um, preliminary considerations for us as we come to this chapter. Um, firstly, we can see from this chapter how important the subject is. And uh, what is interesting is that the 1689 Confession, as we've noted, is based on the Westminster Confession, which was drawn up in 1647, and the Savoy Confession, which was drawn up in 1658. The Westminster was a Presbyterian Confession, and the Savoy a Congregational, Congregationalist one. Now, this chapter represents a new addition to the Westminster Confession. In other words, we find this chapter in the Savoy Confession and in the 1689, but not in the Westminster Confession. Now, sometimes the uh, writers of the Savoy and 1689 Confessions added something or changed something in the Westminster Confession because the beliefs of the Congregationalists and Baptists were slightly different from those of the Presbyterians. But that is not the case here. The aim was not to try and explain any doctrine distinctive to Congregationalists and Baptists, which was not held by the Presbyterians. Rather, the aim was this, and let me read for you from the introduction to the Savoy Confession. After the 19th chapter, we have added a chapter of the Gospel, it being a title that may not well be omitted in a confession of faith. In which chapter what is dispersed and by intimation in the Assembly's Confession, that is the Westminster Confession, with some little addition is here brought together and more fully under one head. In other words, this chapter represents and presents very little which is not found in other chapters of the Confession. But what it does is it focuses the teaching on the Gospel that can be found scattered throughout the other chapters. And specifically, <clears throat> it draws on the doctrines of revelation, God's sovereignty, election, and effectual calling. And it puts them together in such a way as to explain God's revelation of the gospel and how the gospel goes out to save people and the importance of the gospel. And uh, if we think about this, why did the writers of the Savoy Confession add a whole new chapter and want to gather together all these things? It is because the subject is so important, because we need to understand how God uses the gospel to bring about salvation. And we need to inquire whether anyone can be saved without the gospel. Can anyone be saved without the gospel? That is a an important point, and we'll come back to it. Now, just uh, the second point of introduction, we need to understand the fundamental concept which underlies this chapter. 
And that is the distinction between general revelation and special revelation. General revelation, as we saw in chapter 1, is the, is the revelation of God which is generally available. Anybody living anywhere at any time has been able to see God's general revelation. It's found in nature and in human conscience. And we are, are told that in nature God reveals His power. We'll see that in a moment. This revelation, general revelation, in other words, makes God's qualities known. But general revelation is inadequate for salvation. In order for people to be saved, they need a further revelation, what we call a special revelation, which is given supernaturally at particular times and in particular places. Let's turn to Psalm 19, which helps us to understand these, this distinction. Psalm 19 it starts off, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. There we have it in nature. God's uh, glory is proclaimed. Um, the characteristics of God, some of them at least. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. So there's no person living who has ever lived who has not been exposed to God's general revelation. However, we come to verse 7 where we read of God's special revelation in the scripture which had been collected up to that point in time. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. And so it goes on. But the, the essential distinction between the two is clear. The law of the Lord, which is special revelation, is able to revive the soul. In other words, it's able to bring about salvation. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple, to instruct people in the ways of God. Um, and so we see that special revelation is able to do things which revela general revelation cannot do. It's specifically able to lead to salvation. And thus the psalm ends in verse 14. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Because of God's working through special revelation, he is known as our rock and our redeemer. Now let's move on to a consideration of what the confession has to say. The first paragraph deals with what is entitled there the inauguration of the gospel revelation. In other words, the first revelation of the gospel. And what we need to note is that this revelation is found right at the beginning of the Bible. Let's read the confession together. It says, as the covenant of works was broken by man's sin and was unable to confer life. Okay, this is the framework in which the gospel revelation was first given. Uh, the covenant of works was broken. That agreement, that covenant which God made with Adam, that if he obeyed, he would have life. You can refer back to chapter 7 for more information about the covenant of works. But we know that Adam and Eve sinned and therefore broke that covenant and therefore forfeited eternal life. And so there was need for salvation. But right there, at the time of the first sin, God gave a promise. Let's read together that wonderful promise. In Genesis 3 verse 15. God speaks to the serpent and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now this promise speaks of, in the old uh, translation, the seed of the woman, the offspring of the woman, who will crush Satan's head, even though Satan will strike his heel. And uh, that promise concerns a redeemer. One who would deliver mankind from this curse 
that had come as a result of sin. And uh, if we look at Scripture together, although Adam and Eve didn't have this perspective when God gave them the promise, but if we look at the whole of Scripture together, we see that this promise concerns Christ. He is the one who, who was the seed of the woman and who ultimately crushed Satan's head. Colossians chapter 2, we read how uh, by his death on the cross, he defeated Satan and all the powers of evil. And so there we have at the very beginning of the Bible, the promise of a Redeemer, which is fulfilled in Christ. And what we must understand is that this is special revelation. God spoke. He specifically said something about this Redeemer. Without God having spoken, nobody would have known about the Redeemer. It would have been impossible for Adam and Eve or anybody else to know that there could be a Redeemer and that they could be saved from sin if uh, God had not given such a special revelation. We see the function of this promise, the gospel promise, part C, by means of the promise, the elect would be called and faith and repentance wrought in their hearts. In this, the fullness with which it was inaugurated, in this promise, the very substance of the gospel was revealed as the effectual means for the conversion and salvation of sinners. So this promise that we have here in Genesis 3.15 contains in seed form the substance of the gospel. That seed had to grow, it had to become a great big tree, it had to bear fruit. Um, and so it, uh, it does in the later revelation throughout Scripture. But here in this promise, Genesis 3 verse 15, we have the substance of the gospel revealed as the effectual means for the conversion and salvation of sinners. So there we see the beginning, the inauguration of the gospel revelation. Now we need to understand the necessity of this revelation, and that is dealt with in paragraph 2. Firstly, we have the affirmation of its necessity. This promise of Christ and of salvation by Him is revealed to men by the Word of God alone. Now what the confession means when it speaks about the Word of God is the Old and New Testaments. It means the Scriptures which God has inspired and it is saying here that there is no other place outside of Scripture where we will find the message of Jesus Christ, the gospel message. The gospel message cannot be invented, cannot be devised, it cannot be deduced, it cannot be thought out by the mind of man. It must be given by God. And um, it's important for us to understand that this gospel message comes to us through the Old Testament and the New Testament. Let's just look firstly at Romans 1 verse 2. There um, we read the gospel God promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. In other words, Paul here is speaking about the Old Testament and he says that God promised the gospel about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Uh, as far as the New Testament goes, the New Testament is essentially the preaching of the apostles. And Paul says something very interesting about this gospel message in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 21. He says, Since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Now let's just unpack that a little bit. We have the statement at the end of the verse, the foolishness of what was preached. Now Paul is there referring to the gospel message which the apostles of the New Testament preached. Okay, so we have that preserved for us in the New Testament. Then secondly, we must note at the beginning of verse 21, the world through its wisdom did not know God. In other words, by mere human reason, 
mankind is unable to come to a knowledge of God. No matter how clever a person might be, no matter how much he might know, he is unable to come to a saving knowledge of God. How does the saving knowledge of God come? God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. The only way a person can be saved is by hearing the preaching of the gospel, which is what we have preserved for us in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Just to confirm that, Romans chapter 10, verses 13 to 15. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can one... And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Now, of course, if um, this is true, if the promise of Christ and of salvation by him is revealed to men by the word of God alone, there are certain implications and certain questions arise naturally in our mind. Questions like, can a person be saved without a knowledge of the gospel? What about those who have never heard about Christ? Won't they be saved if they live up to the light which they have received? Isn't that a phrase which we hear often? God will judge people according to the light which they have received. If the heathens who have never heard of Christ live up to the light which they have received, they will be saved. Well, what does the Bible say? And to answer this question, I think we can most helpfully answer it by looking at the book of Romans. And we can see that the book of Romans argues very powerfully against the notion of any kind of salvation apart from Christ. Let's consider Paul's argument here briefly. Firstly, it's good to remember that Paul wrote the book of Romans, the letter to the Romans, in preparation for a trip to Spain. In Romans 15, 24, we read that Paul was wanting to go to Spain. Now let's think about the people who lived in Spain. Amongst them, there were definitely people who hadn't heard the gospel, clearly. There, the gospel had not extended to that part of the world yet. That's why Paul was so eager to go there. And so we should remember, as we read the book of Romans, that Paul has in mind, when he writes the book, people who have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Secondly, let us note the theme of the book, Romans 1 verses 16 and 17. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Now notice what Paul says there, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. How are people saved, according to Paul and according to the Holy Spirit here, through the gospel? Now perhaps one might say that this doesn't exclude the possibility that God may be able to save people without using the gospel. If I say to you, uh, my car will get you uh, to church today, that doesn't mean that your car won't get you to church. There may be another means of getting there. We might say, well, Paul says the gospel is the power of God for salvation. That doesn't mean there's not another power of God for salvation. But let's, le let's see how Paul's argument develops. In, in uh, chapter 1, verses 18 to 32, we see that Paul has the Gentiles in mind. Uh, from chapter 1, verse 18, up to 3, verse 19, 20, Paul is seeking to prove that all mankind is guilty before God and condemned by God. And he deals firstly with the Gentiles and secondly with the Jews from chapter 2, verse 1. Here in chapter 1, verses 18 to 32, 
Paul thinks about the Gentiles. He thought, thinks about those people whose religious heritage does not include God's revelation of the gospel in the Old Testament. And look what he says about them in verses 19 to 23. He says, Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. There is general revelation. It shows God's qualities, His eternal power and divine nature. And what does Paul say? So that men are without excuse. Why? For although they knew God, they had the revelation of God, yet they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. The people knew, the Gentiles knew enough about God to know that they should worship Him, and yet they did not do so. Therefore, they are justly punished by God. What is Paul saying here? He is saying that the Gentiles, who did not have the gospel, did not live up to the light which they had received. The light which they had received told them about God, who ought to be worshipped. They did not live up to that light. They exchanged the glory of God for images. Let's continue. Romans 2 verse 12, All who sin apart from the law, that is the Gentiles, will also perish apart from the law. 2 verse 14 and 15, Indeed, when the Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their conscience is also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. Chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. As it is written, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. Uh, chapter 3 Verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. You see what Paul's, Paul's argument says at this point. He says, nobody is righteous. Everybody is guilty before God. Nobody can be saved on the strength of his own goodness. We understand clearly that Paul has in mind here all kinds of people, Jews and Gentiles, constantly through Romans, he repeats that refrain, Jew and Gentile, those who have the gospel and those who don't. Now what is Paul's answer to this predicament? It is found in, in verses 21 onwards of chapter 3. He says, but now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known. Okay, the predicament of man is that he has no righteousness, whether he be Jew or Gentile. But God has an answer to this predicament. There is a righteousness that he gives, and which he has, has made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. Paul says there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Well, that's what he means when he says there is no difference. Whether you're a Jew who grew up with the Old Testament or a Gentile who grew up without the Old Testament, there is no difference. The righteousness that God gives comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Why? Because all have sinned, verse 23. All have sinned. In other words, Jew and Gentile have sinned. And all fall short of the glory of God. Jew and Gentile fall short of the glory of God. But, verse 24, all Jew and Gentile 
are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Now we can understand what Paul says in chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. He says, I'm obligated to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. And the verses we read in chapter 10, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? And so if we listen to this whole argument as Paul develops it, we see that it is very difficult to believe that Paul conceived of any way of salvation for anybody except God's way of salvation through the gospel. If, we're going to, if we want to summarize his reasoning, it is this. Step one, all have sinned. Therefore, all need God's redemption. That redemption comes through Christ. That redemption can only be received through the gospel. Therefore, Paul's passion, Paul's passion is to complete the task that God gave him, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace, Acts 20, verse 24. That is why Paul is obligated to all to preach the gospel to all. And so we come back to paragraph 2 of the Confession and let's read section B, the implications of its necessity. Neither the works of creation and providence nor the light of nature reveal Christ and His grace to men, not even in a general or obscure way. Much less is it possible by their means for men who lack the revelation of Christ by the promise of the gospel to attain to saving faith or repentance. Now, as we think about this doctrine, we must understand that it is not one which we should hold in an arrogant or a doctrinaire way. It is one which ought to make us quiver before God with compassion for those who have not heard the gospel. And our spirit should be that which is expressed in the words of that well known hymn. Facing a task unfinished. The second verse says, Where other lords beside thee hold their unhindered sway, where forces that defied thee defy thee still today, with none to heed their crying for life and love and light, unnumbered souls are dying and pass into the night. And hence the conclusion, facing a task unfinished that drives us to our knees, a need that undiminished rebukes our slothful ease. We who rejoice to know Thee, renew before Thy throne the solemn pledge we owe Thee to go and make Thee known. That was Paul's passion. It was Paul's passion. And that should be our passion too, because nobody can be saved without the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, the question arises, if people cannot be saved about, uh, without the gospel, we ask the question, what about those who've never heard? Why, have, why haven't they received the gospel? That is further answered in paragraph 3 of the Confession. Let's read it together. The revelation of the gospel to sinners, both to nations and to certain persons, together with the promises and precepts which belong to gospel obedience, has been made at various times and in a variety of places, according to the sovereign will and good pleasure of God. The promise of the making known of the gospel has not been made contingent upon any good use made by men of their native abilities, developed by means of light common to all. For such a development has never taken place, nor can it do so. Hence, in all ages, the extent to which the gospel has been proclaimed 
whether to wider or more confined areas, has been granted to persons and nations in greatly varying measures according to the all-wise will of God. Now, I would uh, refer you to those proof texts, Psalm 147, Matthew 11, and then just look at Acts 16, verse 7 together. Paul is on what we call his second missionary journey in Acts chapter 16. He's preached the gospel in the eastern part of Asia Minor, uh, the eastern part of what is today Turkey. And now he wants to start moving westwards. And it seems that he has his eye on the city of Ephesus, which was the capital of the Roman province of Asia on the southwestern coast of Turkey as it is today. Ephesus was a very big city, a very important city. And Paul no doubt knew that if he went to Ephesus, um, it would be a center from which the gospel could move out to the surrounding regions. So Paul planned carefully. But listen to what happened. Paul and his, uh, Acts 16 verse 6, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Okay, the province of Asia where Ephesus was. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia. But the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to do so. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. You see very clearly, how it is in God's sovereign plan as to where the gospel must be preached and when. Paul wanted to go to Ephesus. The Spirit kept him from preaching the word in the province of Asia. He wanted to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them. God said, go to Macedonia and preach the gospel in Philippi. It is in God's sovereign control. And what we must note here is the God-centeredness of the confession. The confession does not try to make excuses for what seems fair and unfair to us as human beings. The confession seeks to give glory to God, to recognize His sovereignty in the proclamation of the gospel. The last paragraph, paragraph 4, affirms the sufficiency of the gospel revelation but qualifies its sufficiency. Let's read it together. The assertion, the gospel is the only external means of making Christ and saving grace known to men, and it is completely adequate for this purpose. Refer to Romans 1, 16 and 17. But, the qualification of its sufficiency, but that men who are dead in their sins may be born again, that is to say, made alive or regenerated, something further is essential, namely an effectual, invincible work of the Holy Spirit upon every part of the soul of man, whereby a new spiritual life is produced. Nothing less than such a work will bring about conversion to God. Now what the conversion is saying here is that there are two things necessary for salvation. Firstly, there is an outward proclamation of the gospel required. An outward proclamation of the gospel which can be apprehended and understood by the mind. This is something outward, it is something ob 